Welcome, all of you, to St. Andrew's Episcopal Church. I'm John Roars, the rector here. I'm so glad you have joined us uh, for this service of online worship. If you'd like to learn more about uh, the life of our church, ways to get connected and get involved in our programs and ministries, or if you'd like to make a donation, uh, please visit our website listed here. We'd love uh, to have you take part in the life of our community. Uh, God's blessing be with you today and always. and welcome back to our St. Andrew's Broadcasting Network today, Sunday, October 4th. Um, it's been wonderful to see some of you in person at our evening worship services on Sundays at 5 and 6. Those are happening outdoors, um, and if you'd like to learn more and make a reservation, you can visit our website um, or check your weekly happenings email. Uh, we are grateful to those of you who continue to join us online, and we are hoping to add um, some morning opportunities, both indoors and outdoors, later in October, so stay tuned. But again, thank you for joining us on our, on our broadcasting network. We begin uh, with the opening acclamation. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Please pray with me the Collect for Purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. And our collect for the day. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray and to give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask, except through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, 
one God forever and ever. Amen. We continue with the readings. A reading from Philippians. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For, the, for his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus said, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir, come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. The Gospel of the Lord. In our epistle reading for today, Paul is writing to the early church at Philippi, the new Christians there. And he begins by bragging about what a righteous Jew he was before his conversion. He establishes that his credentials were exceptional. He was the best persecutor of the church. And yet he says that all of this was worthless compared to what he has found in his life in Christ. I'll read you a portion here just to remind you. Yet whatever gains I had, he says, these come I have come to regard as lost because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as lost because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish. What a great word, rubbish. So he continues in this fashion with dramatic language and this sort of powerful conviction. And it's not surprising when we consider Paul's conversion story. You might recall it from Acts when Paul is the most righteous Jew and the best persecutor of the church is walking along on the road to Damascus and suddenly there's a blinding light and the voice of Jesus comes to him and says, Paul, go to Damascus and wait for further instruction. 
and he's blinded. So he gets to Damascus and he's blind and he doesn't eat for three days and he prays. And then God sends a messenger, Ananias, to come to, to Paul and to tell him what God's uh, mission is for him. And his mission, of course, is to spread the gospel to the world, to Jews and Gentiles alike, um, and to, to help establish um, God's church. Needless to say, this mission wasn't easy. And yet, in Paul's letters, we see this unwavering certainty, like what we hear in today's epistle. Even as Paul tries to sort out various theological issues and tries to address problems that are arising in the new churches, he writes with this conviction and this clarity about his faith. And I have to say that I find it to be some combination of enviable and annoying. Most of us, I don't think, have that same conversion moment like Paul had on the road to Damascus. For me, um, faith is, is less like a blinding light and more like a muddling through. And my faith brings hope and consolation and joy for sure, um, but it is also marked by a lot of questioning and wrestling. But setting aside um, Paul's Paul's rather uh, dramatic language, towards the end of this passage, he says something that I think is really important. He says, Christ Jesus has made me his own. Christ Jesus has made me his own. And there, I think, is the heart of our faith. It's really not about whether we've had the blinding light moment or whether we struggle with lots of questions and doubts. It's really about God's act, God's saving act in Jesus Christ. It's about God's gracious act of making us God's own. At the end of January, when people were still traveling, um, I went to a big conference hosted by the National Church. And the name of the conference was Rooted in Jesus. And I got kind of a kick out of this name, and I told people as often as possible that I was going to Atlanta to go get rooted in Jesus. It was a great conference, and I came back feeling excited and inspired. But the fact of the matter is, we are all already rooted in Jesus. That is what God did in the life, death, and resurrection of his Son. God made us God's own, rooting us in Jesus. Lately, it feels like our country and our world are unrooted, to say the least. The isolation and the daily stresses of the pandemic, the unrest in our country, the vitriol of the upcoming elections, the wildfires and the hurricanes and that devastation, combined with our own personal losses and challenges, have made it an overwhelming time for many of us. I think that today we're encouraged to return over and over again to rest in the knowledge that Christ has made us his own. However you pray, however you say your prayers or talk to God, let that be what centers you this week. Breathe it in and out. Say it as you take a walk and enjoy the beautiful fall weather. However you say your prayers, return to that knowledge that we are rooted in Jesus. A friend of mine, Sarah, from Divinity School, is a Lutheran pastor in Northern Virginia. And since the pandemic uh, began, she has posted nightly reflections on Facebook. And Facebook certainly has plenty of evils, but I will say that this has been really meaningful to me. Her words and reflections um, have begun and ended the same each day. They begin saying, God holds you day, whatever. Today we're like at 2000 or 200. And each one ends the same way. She says, God holds you. Sleep well, world. At the end of each day, she is reminding us of the same thing that Paul says to us in the letter to the Philippians. Rest in the knowledge that Christ has made you his own. It is good news worth returning to over and over again. Amen. We continue with our prayers of the people. Today I'm using Form 4, found on page 388 of your Book of Common Prayer. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, and give them courage and hope in their troubles, and bring them the joy of your salvation. We remember especially all those on our parish prayer list. We remember those who are suffering in the fires out west and those who are fighting those fires. We remember all of those who have been victims to coronavirus and all of those who are grieving. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I invite you to sum up all of the prayers on your hearts and minds by praying with me in the words that our Lord Jesus Christ taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. My friends, life is short and we do not have much chance to gladden the lives of those who travel with us. So be swift to love and make haste to be kind. And the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you always. Amen.